We can be dream makers, nurturing, compassionate. Nosotros podemos ser más unidos. We can be anything. I'm Grant Oliphant. This is We Can Be. Today our guest is Henry Timms, the executive director of the historic 92nd Street Y in New York City, the renowned cultural and community center that serves 300,000 visitors annually and engages millions more through their digital and online platforms. Henry is co-author of the best-selling new book, New Power, How Power Works in Our Hyperconnected World and How to Make It Work for You. In 2012, he founded Giving Tuesday in partnership with the United Nations Foundation. Giving Tuesday raised over $300 million in 2017 alone and has made nearly 22 billion online impressions in the half decade since it was created. Henry has made a worldwide impression himself, and I am happy he is with us today. So we're here for the P4 conference in Pittsburgh to think about the four Ps, and I'm gonna add this afternoon a fifth power. This ability to harness the energy of the connected crowd. This new power, if you are able to do that, you are likely to come out on top. Henry Timms, thank you so much for being here today. What a pleasure. It's a delight to both have you on the podcast, but also to have you in Pittsburgh to talk to our P4 conference, which is all about trying to help people be intentional about the future we want to create as a community. You're in the midst of rolling out a new paradigm for how people can change society in new and powerful ways, which you call new power. What is new power? The way that we think about this is new power has kind of become the essential skill of the 21st century, which is this ability to harness the energy of the connected crowd. You know, scan the world for a second and think who's coming out on top and whether it's the unexpected election of Trump or the unexpected election of Obama, or it's these amazing movements like Me Too or Never Again, or it's the platforms like Facebook and Uber. What's constant across all of these phenomena is people are working out how to capture this energy of the crowd. And so new power is that set of skills and that phenomenon. And in our age, no matter what you're trying to do, and, and you know, here in Pittsburgh, you look at all the different efforts going on to think about what the future of Pittsburgh looks like. Those people who work out to mobilize best are likely to shape that more than anybody else. So we wrote the book to try and popularize the frame to say, look, we need to start thinking about this idea of new power and what it means. But just as importantly, to kind of lay out the skills of new power, because this is a set of skills that many of us didn't have and many of us now need to learn. So what are those skills? So let's just start by thinking about raising a movement. You think about kind of the skill sets of the old power world. You know, I run a 144-year-old institution. And for a long time, we operated on essentially as a download model, right? We would create content and our audiences would consume it. And that worked brilliantly well. And we still do that. And it's terrific. But there's a new opportunity now, and I go further and say a new obligation, that alongside that old power model of just kind of creating content and downloading it to the world, we all have to work out how to upload the views of others. So how do we create opportunities where people can engage in their terms in our mission? This whole generation of people who want to do more, they want to participate in their world, creating avenues for them to do that is what New Power is all about. Most of us still dwell, I think, in an old power world. And you've described a little bit already, and you do in, in exquisite detail in the book, which I can't recommend highly enough, the things that old power gets wrong, but old power is represented by large institutions and bureaucracies, top-down structures. Describe what makes old power unsuitable for the world we're living in today. I think sometimes it's not. Our argument has never been old power bad, new power good. If you want to succeed, you have to understand old power and new power and know effectively when to pull each lever. Right? How do you blend these two things together? So let's think about something which we would classify as a very old power value, like expertise, professionalism, and long-term experience, and, and all of these things. Now, I don't think there's been a time in recent decades, I wouldn't say centuries, but decades, when expertise has mattered more, because we're seeing the climate deniers and the anti-vaxxers and the crazies on the internet do really very well at spreading their ideas and ideologies. And 
those experts who have all the facts in the world and all the peer validated reviews in the world and all the white papers and all the symposia, they have all of those assets which serve them very well in the old power world, but yet those things aren't resonating. We need these players to kind of enter the fray, to learn how to spread their ideas, to learn how to build movements. Because if we aren't building movements and spreading ideas around these enlightenment values, we're going to fall very far behind. And, that, and that's one of my biggest worries right now is that all the things we care about most, we're, we're very high often on righteousness and very low on mobilization capacity. And, and, and I want to help close that gap. Now, the first time I heard you talk about this, you were candid that this is either good or bad. And you cited as one example ISIS's success in recruiting. We were horrified when we learned that our daughter had become radicalized and had traveled to Aleppo in Syria. So there's a Scottish schoolgirl called Aksa Mahmood who grew up in a good school in Glasgow. She loved Harry Potter. And then one day she simply disappears. Uh, three days later, she calls her parents and she's on the border heading into Syria. Uh, and she has made jihad and become a member of ISIS. But her story doesn't then stop. Once she reaches Syria, she becomes one of the most effective recruiters for ISIS. She creates, and this is a very sobering phrase, a girl-to-girl -girl network of girls around the world who she connects around ISIS's ideology. Now on her Tumblr blog, Mahmoud lashes out at the West and gives girls advice on joining ISIS. Bring a good pair of boots and makeup and jewelry because trust me, there is absolutely nothing here. It has all of these tips for what you want to do if you want to make jihad and she starts to connect with these girls around the world who make the same journey that she did. She's so adept with social media. Her Tumblr page is full of these kind of exciting emojis and videos and ideas. And by doing this, she she manages to influence women and girls all around the world to make the same journey. She essentially used this new technology and this new power to mobilize around a medieval theocracy <laughs> and, and think about what at the same time the US State Department was doing. So at the same time, Aksa Mahmoud is spreading her ideas sideways in these very sophisticated digital ways. The US government originally is dropping cartoons from the backs of bombers over Syria and Iraq. Literally paper cartoons falling down on the heads of the civilian population, trying to influence change with a tactic that was first used in the First World War. Mm. And that's the kind of old power tactic we need to shift our mindset, is that if we're still expecting that the way we influence change is our kind of top-down ideas landing on people's heads and then them suddenly realizing the error of their ways, we're never going to compete with the world where the Aksa Mahmoods of this world are working out how new power can flow in some very dangerous directions. How is it an example of ISIS being adroit at aligning her objectives with their objectives? It's perhaps the real skill of how you think about this kind of work is they were prepared to release a lot of control. Obviously, ISIS has some very clear ideas from a kind of political perspective about how they want to think about control. But she felt completely empowered to take up the ISIS message, to make it her own, to shape it in ways she wanted to. Her Tumblr blog was full of things like tips to other girls about what kind of toiletries they should bring. So she wasn't just repeating the press release that had been issued. She was grabbing this idea and making it her own. And I think that's the key insight, which is what people are looking for now. And we see this in the most successful movements, whether they're very positive or very negative. What people are looking for is a sense of agency and a sense of belonging. Now, that's not a new phenomenon. That's existed since time immemorial. But all of these new platforms and all these new tools are feeding that need, right? We all want to feel more involved. We all want to feel like we're more an actor in our times. And if those on the side of the angels, the universities, the governments, the enlightenment institutions, if they aren't providing meaningful routes to participation, then we're leaving the field open for organizations like ISIS to do it much better. In your study of movements that have been successful, is it a conscious decision for them to let go and let the movement move beyond them? Or is that an accidental thing that they just had to learn how to live with? I'm sure it's a bit of both, but I think it's a good test. And one thing we always talk about with this work is it's only a movement if it moves without you. And often people are talking about movements right now. I got served an ad on Facebook the other day by Banana Republic, which said at the top, join the movement. And then instead of the bottom, buy these chinos. And like that, that's how far this movement y language is everywhere right now. Well, you do know there's no concept, no matter how sacred, that American advertising won't come out, right? <laughs> Not successfully, but well, I think that was the chinos rather than the advertising. We, we get stuck in this binary, which is that we have two options complete control or complete chaos. And actually, that isn't the case. The people who do this very well, they actually create structures which allow themselves to release the right amount of control. And by releasing the right amount of control, they get to much better outcomes. There's a really interesting firm 
called Local Motors that we studied in the book. And they're a car manufacturing company, right, which is as old power as it gets, right? You make a bunch of cars, you put them down an assembly line, they come out the other end and the public buys them or not. And what Local Motors have done is said, help us design our cars, help us kind of co-create these cars. They have this amazing community of people around their cars who have ideas on everything from how the wheels should look to how the bonnet should look to how the gear stick looks. They have complete engagement and involvement in the whole process. And they use this phrase which I really like, which is called drawing the box tightly. And what they mean by that is they're working out exactly the amount, right amount of control to release to allow their crowd to get to successful outcomes in terms of how they engage with local motors as a company. There's sometimes when local motors have to put their foot down and say, no, no, this has to be seven inches or more, right? This is not, we can't have a wheel which is over X or over Y. So they're very prescriptive about control, but they work out just the right amount of agency to release. And I think that's part of the skill set for all of us now, which is how do we draw the box tightly? How do we shift out of our old power mindsets and create these spaces where other people can engage in our world on their terms. Now, you provide a different kind of example in the book as well about the National Rifle Association being adept at figuring out where that line can be drawn to its advantage. Yeah, so I think the NRA is a brilliant and sobering example of how they can blend power. They have this terrific old power brand, right? It's feared by lawmakers. You do not want to get a bad grade. People will preemptively resign the fear around the brand is actually much greater than the reality. They're actually it's such a feared brand that they're not actually spending as much money as you might think to influence their decisions, but they've got this really good, scary old power brand. But alongside that, they've got this ecosystem of people in a very new power way who feel very engaged and very involved in their world and they have a huge amount of agency of doing things on their terms. Time and again, we'll hear the same statistics, which is you know 90% of Americans believe in sensible gun control. But what the NRA's new power flank is able to do is dial up this intensity. So when the phones of politicians need to start ringing, the NRA is out dialing everybody else time and time again. And I think that's another important lesson of the new power era, which is the ability to generate intensity has become so much more valuable than favorability. It's a very different way of thinking about success. So you think about the, the Hillary Trump election. Now, neither of their favorables were anything to write home about, right? But throughout the campaign, Hillary had higher favorables than Trump but he had much greater intensity. And so what the NRA does so effectively is they generate real intensity through their new power wing. And, and those on the sides of gun control, for a long time, neither had the old power nor the new power. Now the Parkland kids may have changed that. So what we are beginning to see, I hope, is that the kind of the new power wing of the gun control lobby has emerged. The question will now be how they relay that change to those old power actors who now need to fill the space with policy outcomes. February 14th is my sister's birthday. She had to spend that birthday huddled under a desk. And I know a lot of people are out there saying that we need to make America safe again. And I know that we can't. We cannot make America safe again until we arm our teachers. We need to arm them with pencils, pens, paper, and the money they need. They need that money to support their families and to support themselves. Parkland happened after your book had been written, so you're not able to dive into that as an example, but I imagine you're getting questioned about that all the time. What have the Parkland students gotten right in terms of new power? They worked out very quickly how they could get to real scale, and they worked out how to think about leadership in a very leaderful mo movement. That's a phrase that I learned from the Black Lives Matters founders. So they talk about Black Lives Matters not as leaderless, but leader full. There's lots of space for people to step up and be a leader. It's a really important thing if you're looking to shift outcomes in a new power era. If it's all about you, there'll be very little space for everybody else. What the Parkland kids did well is that all these rallies around the country were led by somebody. All these different rallies, someone stepped up to take a leadership role and to orchestrate and to animate around that. So I think they did a really good job of that. I think they did a really good job of, of driving intensity. And I think the real question now is actually going to be about their capacity to relay that change with the old power world. One of the interesting things that we're getting stuck on now in the philanthropy world is we're always blaming movements for not becoming institutions, and we're always blaming institutions for not becoming movements. So we're always saying to movements, well, you haven't got enough policy wins. That was always the Occupy critique. All these people met around the country, right. but nothing changed. And we're always attacking institutions for not mobilizing well enough. And I think there's actually some interplay we ought to be encouraging. And we think of that as kind of a relay effect. 
the movement can shift the cultural narrative. It can get people thinking in very different ways. And then it's up to some of those old power actors to step in and move things along. And, and actually, I think if you look back at Occupy, Occupy as a new power movement shifted a bunch of cultural narratives, brought an issue front and center. And then in that gap, a lot of old power actors started to fill the space. So you look at the Ford Foundation repositioning its work around inequality. You look at the success of Thomas Piketty. You look at how inequality is now something that's being addressed, not with the speed we need it to be addressed, but certainly at scale. That's an issue which is now everywhere all of the time. I think you can give a lot of credit to the Occupy movement for beginning that relay. I love that concept of being leaderful. It is a critical distinction, I think. Do you see it playing out in the same way with movements like Me Too and Time's Up and the March for Science? I think definitely there are kind of three things you can unpack about something like Me Too. Gay people in action, you know, Me Too is literally that. It connected people to each other. So it literally became stronger. Every woman who stepped forward strengthened the whole movement. Every woman who stepped forward was supported by the women next to her. In the old power world, right, you would have one movement, it would be trademarked, it would be called one thing everywhere, and everyone would have to keep it in line, right? There would be a set of rules you would insist upon. In the new power world, the things that work are able to shift and to morph. And the reason that Me Too had so many leaders was because it was designed to allow that. It created that context for others to, to step up and to lead. And I think that's a really important lesson if you're thinking about your own ideas and how you want them to shift in the world. Have you left space for other people to be leaders, not just you? Let's think for a second about how Harvey Weinstein exercised power. So it was very command and control. He hoarded up this power. It was like a currency he could spend down at his choosing. He could greenlight films. He could start and stop career. He could hold down rumors. And then think about how differently the Me Too movement exercised its power. It began with an activist called Tarana Burke and at the end of last year spread all around the world using power in a very different way. Power not as a currency held by one person and hoarded up, but power as a current, something that flowed around the world and it got stronger as every woman stepped forward to strengthen the whole movement with her own testimony. Me Too as a movement even changed and adapted as it went around the world. When it got to France, it shifted from being Me Too to being Renounce Your Pig, which is very French. You know, one of the things, though, that strikes me as I read your book and as I listen to you talk and the, the notion that new power uh, gives us agency is so powerful and clearly plays out in, in some of the cases that you've described. It also is predicated at least in part on a technology that is designed to manipulate us. So if we think about the business model that underlies social media, we are in fact the product yeah. that is being sold and it's our attention that's being bought and that's made us ripe for advertising campaigns from third parties who can persuade us to do everything from buy the pair of chinos that you don't want yeah. to vote a different way in a U.S. election. And to what extent are you concerned that the vehicles of new power are also insidious in ways that we're not seeing? Uh, deeply. There are various arguments, all of which are turning out to be a fiction. The first was these tools will democratize. The existence of these tools would instantly democratize the world and we would all be much freer and much more equal. That didn't turn out to be true. We then went through a period where everyone said, well, these tools are value neutral. They can be good, they can be bad. Right. <laughs> well, yes, they're value neutral, unless their primary purpose is to return a profit to shareholders, <laughs> but that makes them a lot less value neutral. So I think we're now entering the third stage of that debate where people are saying, okay, look, we have these amazing new power tools, and let's use Facebook as an example. It's amazing capacity to mobilize people, to give people agency. We all have this chance to share our views and we have the quote power to share and we can broadcast our lives and engage with our friends and it does give us huge amounts of agency. And I should note too, has done all sorts of goods for the world, right? There've been all sorts of very positive outcomes from platforms like Facebook. Having said all that, the, si the size and scale of Facebook now is so significant that it has essentially re-intermediated our world in ways which are so much deeper and more dangerous than the previous set of intermediaries. You know, we used to worry about TV stations or the newspaper holders, right, who, whose power is actually very limited relative to what Facebook is capable of now doing. Because if the tools by which we participate skew so heavily towards private interest, then we're never going to be able to push them in the direction that society needs to push them. So I think one of the things we've advocated for is 
one, a lot more interoperability, which is this idea that you can take your data with you. So you don't have to stay on one platform all the time, but actually you imagine you can carry your data like you do a suitcase on vacation. You can take it around the world with you and then you can loan it out to various people. And two is this idea of a, of a public interest algorithm, which is, you know, we have a public broadcasting, we have a public interest test for media. How would you think about an algorithm which serves the public interest? How would you think about an algorithm which you could dial up and dial down, which we could see into, which we could make more thoughtful decisions about how it influences our lives? That's the next set of conversations to happen. I'm just, I'm curious how you came by that. You lead a venerable 140 year old institution. And then it seems a few years ago, you got religion around technology and innovation and you launched this thing called Giving Tuesday, which became a worldwide movement and phenomenon and I think was your entree into understanding this new power world you were seeing. But how did you make that leap yourself as a nonprofit leader? I think I'd always been thinking about what was changing, that we're going to need nonprofits more than ever, and we're going to need them to experiment with new models. And that's the hardest thing. The easy thing is new technology is simply, you, you think of new technology as a way of repurposing the stuff you've always done. So you've been doing this for years, and so now you do a Facebook Live, or you put it on the internet, or you find some way of essentially just repurposing your content. What we tried to say is, okay, from first principles, how would you think about the mission of this institution if you took away all the things we've done historically? Do you ever encounter board members or others who say, this is great, Henry, but what do we get out of it? We did. And how did you answer the question? Sharply, but thoughtfully. <laughs> um, and the sharp and thoughtful answer is, show me the bit in our mission where it says it's our job to be famous. And then show me the bit in our mission where it's our job to get credit. Those things aren't in our mission statement. And, and they aren't in the mission statement of any nonprofit. Look, I raise money in New York City, so I'm not naive about this. I understand that we have to have a brand. I understand that we've got to be able to persuade people we do important work. But I do think as a sector, we have overly biased brand over mission. And I think the dirty secret of that is let's not worry about our logo. Let's just get on and do as much good work at scale as we can. And if we do that good work, then the benefits will come back to us anyway. Because the funder who you really care about doesn't care whether you really get your logo on things. They care about whether you're having impact. And, and whether, whether we get credit for that impact or not is of no interest to me. We certainly had those conversations at board level, which were people you know, trying to work out how we were navigating this yeah. world. But that shifted now because I think what people have realized is that we, we made a trade. And the trade was we can get to a scale by having a kind of new power wing of the 92nd Street Y. These programs will get to a scale we would never have got to before, and net net, that actually will get us more funding and more press than anything else. Is it as simple as there's a playbook to follow? And your book lays out a playbook with the right, I mean, the ingredients that yep. you've spoken about. But is there an alchemy involved that's less predictable than maybe the playbook tries to make it seem? It's not about these spikes; it's about the pulse. And I think that's an important shift for practitioners, which is we are all hoping for this amazing spike when everything turns our way. But actually the skill is the pulse that every day you do more and more work in this direction and it starts moving the needle and moving the needle and moving the needle and then once in a while you catch lightning in a jar. But the skill for nonprofits is to do this work daily. We think about that at the 92nd Street Y all the time. Like once in a while, Giving Tuesday was a phenomenon, right? So that is now in 100 countries and, and raised you know over $350 million online in small gifts last year just in the US. So we, it's an incredible thing. We've, we've, only, we've only done that once at that scale. Now we've got, 50, you know, we've probably got 10 projects which are kind of medium and small size Giving Tuesdays, but I wouldn't value them any more or less than Giving Tuesday because it's a, it's a set of, of skills and behaviors. And if we get that stuff right now, if that's the new power wing of our work now, it will strengthen in ways that we can't even imagine. But every day now I'm trying to work out new ways to try and improve my new power skills and, and every day I have a step, step back and every day I... I was going to ask you, have you had a failure? Yeah, we've had lots. I mean, we've, I mean but I, like failure is... Like, we had lots of projects which didn't really work as well as I'd thought. I had this idea for a World's Fair, which I can't get off the ground. I think it'd be really cool. The World's Fair was a very old power thing, right? So everyone gets their exhibits together and goes to one place and everyone looks at, you know, what other people are doing. If we had like a new power World's Fair where people around the world would showcase the very best in their community over a week's period, no matter where you are, just show off the best of what you are and, and what you give to the world in a powerful way, right? That would be just so cool, but I, I just can't get any traction around that. And there's like three or four things just top of mind, which we tried, which didn't get any kind of scale. No one really took them up in the way that, that they should have done. Is any of that failure? I feel like I haven't made enough progress. Like I, I think 
I consistently feel I'm not doing enough to push the innovation agenda. But we've got this amazing innovation team. We've got, we have a whole center now, the Belfer Center for Innovation at the Y. And we have a team of people whose whole job is now all day long to pursue this work. And in a perfect world, that team would be three times the size. I think the whole concept of failure in the social sector is misunderstood. I think failure is great if you learn something from it. And have, are there any takeaways from the things that haven't worked out? There's probably a smarter answer to this, but I'll give you the most truthful one. I wish we pushed harder. Mm. A lesson I fail to learn again and again and again is to be bolder. And especially in today's world, it seems to me that boldness isn't just essential, but it's probably quite highly rewarded. Steady as she goes is actually quite an attractive proposition in some ways because we're doing well right now and like we've had a good couple of years and things go in the right direction. But the thing which is shouting loudest in my ear is double down. And, and I don't think I have done that enough. Great leaders, I think, always feel that way. So um, <laughs> good for you. <laughs> it says something about you. You've actually put this in very stark terms that this, in a way, represents the core of, of how we're going to decide who governs us in the future. Do you really believe that those are the stakes and, and what will it take to have that come out on the right side of us governing ourselves? Well, I think what you're doing in Pittsburgh is a perfect example of the work we need to do, which is that we, we as a community of people, right, are coming together to think about how we create a better sense of of place, how we create a better planet, how we encourage people in more meaningful ways. And if we as a community are mastering these skills first, who is going to? Those are the stakes of our times, which is if if I'm right, and I might not be, but it's hard to imagine a world where it isn't the case that, that, that the future is going to be this battle for mobilization. Whoever mobilizes best is going to win. And if the people who have the things which really matter on their hands, whether you're you know, running a food pantry, whether you're um, working around social justice issues, whether you're an educator, whether you're a teacher, no matter what you are in the world, if you don't have this new power sk skill set, you aren't able to kind of conjure up the crowd and engage with it and mobilize people in ways which are meaningful to them around the things that you care about. We're going to see a lot of other people jump in and push aside the things we care about most. And I, I think we've seen that already, and I do think the stakes are very high. So I think there's kind of two big prescriptions. We have to think differently about platforms, because from a political perspective, platforms have so much power now. But all of us as people need to get these skills into our hands and quick, because those on the side of the angels need to get mobilizing. That's a lovely note on which to end. I just add, the name of this podcast is We Can Be, and I'm curious how you would complete that sentence. We can be joyful. One of the things I always talk about a lot of the work, of all this work that we do, is it has to be joyful. The front, on the front of the 92nd Street Y, the very first word they put in 1929 was rejoice. And I think we do our best work and we are our, our most complete as human beings once we are able to be joyful. Now, there are lots of steps on the way to joy. There are lots of things you have to address first, which are critical issues. But on our good day, I think all of us can create a world that feels more joyful. And I think we can be that. While rapidly advancing technology has a well-documented capacity for evil, the new power dynamic that Henry believes so passionately in also offers enormous opportunity to influence positive change. Our collective task will be to ensure that this new power is used to fully engage with the challenges of our most vulnerable. With Henry Timms as an enthusiastic leader in this still unfolding realm, I am hopeful that together, we can indeed use this new power for the good of all.